Um, okay, we can get started. So today we're going to talk about reasonability in T debates. We're going to talk about how we can describe reasonability in a slightly more refined way that avoids some of the traditional problems with reasonability and some of the normal responses to reasonability that people make. And we will go through some examples of how you can formulate this argument towards the end if we have a little bit of time. So before we get into it, I am curious if what kind of y'all's pre-existing definitions of reasonability are. So what would you say reasonability as an argument is asking the judge to do? What do we think? So Nag reads T, F says reasonability, and they say some words, some assortment of the same words that have been the same for like a decade, yeah. So what is almost there? Or um, what is close enough? The affirmative action is close enough to be possible under their interpretation. Okay, so if so that's one interpretation is the the plan equals close to in negative. What else? Yeah. Okay. Aff interp equals close to neg interp. Anyone else mean something else by this? Yeah. Um, like if our, if the aff interp is sufficiently predictable, then they're aff because like Okay. The apps interpretation is close to good, vaguely understood. Good is good enough. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Anyone mean anything else by reasonability? Okay. Well, I mean, like, kind of, yeah, like, just T is bad. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I think one that I, one that you sometimes hear, you don't hear this one that often, but, like, plan equals close to topic. This is, like, the vaguest one out of all of these, where, like, they don't even say what the topic is, but, like, it used to be your Callie? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, it like used to be the case that occasionally teams would bring up like, oh, this is like a really important thing on the topic. And we talked about that thing, so it must be topical. Like, oh, like you're going for like T security cooperation, but like, no, we talked about NATO and we talked about AI. So like, how could we not be topical, right? So that's kind of this one. So all of this shit, very confusing to begin with. In how many of your T debates would you say any scrutiny has been applied to which one of these things the AF and the NEG is talking about? Anyone ever know? Okay. So that's problem one. Problem two is T close. What do we mean when we say something is close to the NEG's interpretation? How can we tell? So I like I think that the most, I mean, we can we can dispense with a couple of these right away, right? So like this one is meaningless, obviously. Like if we just say, if the app is just standing up and saying, like, oh, we talked about something that's like topic related, that's obviously terrible. Right. So plan being close enough to the next interpretation, a little better. App's interpretation close enough to the next interpretation, a little better than that. But so, like, what do we mean by close? Yeah. Uh, if they have like a list of topical affirmatives, if like it includes most of that topical affirmative, uh, most of those topical affirmatives includes most of those. So, like, it solves limits nearly as well. Yeah. Okay. So, if the AF solves limits, or if the NEG solves limits by limiting the topic to five AFs, and the AF solves it good enough by limiting the topic to six AFs, that's a 16% difference in limits. Is that good enough? Uh, yes, because the R AF is good. 
because RF is good. Interesting. So then now we're kind of just back to the plan is close to the topic, maybe, or like the plan is close enough to an eggs interpretation. Well, what's where's the cutoff for when it would be bad? Is 50% not close? What about if it's secret Fs? Like the next interpretation is your F can't be secret and the Fs interpretation is the F can be secret. Those are literally the opposite of each other. In my mind, they could not be closer, right? So what is the F saying when they say be reasonable? Yeah. Um, the F creates like a vision of the topic or a model of debate that produces like very similar debates like in similar debates okay so it's not that the interpretations are close to each other it's the the like vision of the topic is similar right mm -hmm. okay but like the next vision of the topic is one where they get to go for the do the plan secretly counter plan and the f's vision of the topic is one where they don't that's like pretty radically different like there's a lot of apps that cannot beat the do it secretly counter plan right mm -hmm. so those apps would presumably not be viable under the next vision of the topic that's like a pretty different topic so like i agree if they result in similar topics it's probably it probably meets t close but like what else is the app talking about when they say the interpretations are close to each other what do we think like you can have debatable or yeah mm. so they're close by the metrics that the neg has set up to compare topics right So it's like pretty close in terms of solving limits or it's pretty close in terms of solving the division of ground, right? So like the neg might lose their do the plan secretly counter plan, but they still have plenty of other options or like there's not that many secret Fs. This kind of broad logic is what we're talking about. Yeah. So again, how many people when they're AF going for reasonability have been able to answer the question of where the cutoff is for either of these issues? Or in how many of your debates have you seen the AF do this successfully? How many debates have you seen where the judge votes neg in the face of an AF reasonability push by saying basically, the, yeah, the AF said reasonability, but I had no idea what to do with the AF's instruction for me to be reasonable. So I just voted for limits. Okay. So the goal of this is to think about it differently. So I'm going to zag and say all of this is not the way to go just all of the above. The reason is all of it falls into the same exact pitfall that we've been talking about, which is the judge has no idea what to do with all of this. And the reason is that all of this business is framed by the AF as an alternative to the way that the NEG wants the judge to evaluate the T-debate, which is competing interpretations, right? So have you ever heard the phrase like the 2AC stands up, says reasonability, and then the next words out of their mouth are competing interpretations cause a race to the bottom? Yeah. So this framing of reasonability says to the judge, we would like it better if you did not decide this topicality debate by comparing our interpretations to each other and instead decided this topicality debate by deciding if our interpretation is just good in a vacuum. But the problem is there is no way to decide if the AF's interpretation is good in a vacuum. What you're ultimately doing when you're doing all of this stuff is, as we've all agreed, you are still looking to see if the AF's interpretation or the AF's plan is close to something, right? Whether that is some abstract version of the topic or some abstract version of what a good topic would be or some abstract understanding of the next interpretation, right? Inherently, you are doing comparison. So my pitch to you is let's do it explicitly. So... To do this, I, I'm going to rely extensively on an analogy to a legal concept that those of you who debated on CJR might be familiar with. Rule of lenity. Does this ring a bell for anyone? The rule of lenity. Okay, so the rule of lenity is an idea that courts use when interpreting an ambiguous criminal law. So a criminal law says X thing is a crime. 
But we have a problem. Congress wrote the law vaguely. The law doesn't say exactly what X thing is, or there are multiple interpretations of what X thing is. A criminal gets prosecuted, and they stand up in court and they say, look, the law was vague. There's a vision of this law. There's an interpretation of this law under which what I did would not be criminal, right? It's ambiguous. Sure, you could interpret the law to mean that what I did was criminal, but you could also interpret it differently. And the rule of lenity basically says that in a situation like that, courts should defer to the defendant's interpretation. If the defendant has a reasonable interpretation of the law, if the law was ambiguous, they're, you know, they basically shouldn't be punished for the ambiguity in the law or for violating the ambiguity in the law. Why would we want the court system to work this way? What do we think? What are some advantages of it working this way? Yeah. You know, vague laws uh, allow for like prosecuting anybody for anything that like kind of resembles some like violation of the law. Right. We want to limit the power of the government. We want to make sure that vague laws don't just give a blank check to the government to punish whoever they want for whatever they want. What else? If you're the defendant and you genuinely believe that what you were doing was legal and then you get popped because the law was vague and then the court interprets it broadly, how would you feel about that? Probably pretty bad, right? Like you were trying to do the right thing. You were trying to follow the rules. You like potentially are in the like 0.01% of defendants who actually read what the statute said. And like you re you researched some definitions and you like came to the conclusion that like, oh, this is like a fine way to look at the thing. And then bam, you're like in jail now because the law was interpreted differently by the court. And by the way, there's many reasons for the law to be interpreted broadly by courts in cases like this. Like some of the cases involve like pretty heinous stuff. Like some of the cases about lenity involve like child pornography statutes where like the defendant gets off the hook because they get to say like, oh, I thought this precise definition of the thing wasn't off limits or like vehicle smuggling. There's a famous court case involving a dude who like stole a plane and was like, I, it was my understanding based on this law that like stealing a plane is not classified as a vehicle under the prohibition that like made this a federal crime. And so this should not be like, I should not be prosecuted for this as a federal crime, right? So it's like, these are pretty extreme things that like theoretically there's an argument for why we would want to deter them. But our court system says, generally speaking, if the law is ambiguous, we defer to the defendant because of the idea of fair notice. Hopefully the analogy to T is somewhat obvious, right? Generally speaking, right? There's a similarity between T and between the function that is served by having laws like this, which is that, you know, with T, ideally, the goal of T in debate is to make it so the AF and the NAG generally thinks about similar stuff, right? You've heard this in framework overviews, I'm sure, where like the NAG went for T and like described the role of topicality as forcing a similar conversation or similar research to happen, depending on what side of the resolution that you're on, right? So that enables clash, it enables fairness, whatever, yada, yada, right? So T, even without the framework component, serves a similar function. It's coordinating. It's designed to like make it so the app and NAG generally think about the same stuff. Ideally, in an ideal universe, nobody would ever go for T, right? If the topic was 100% clear and everybody was in 100% agreement on what the topic meant, we would never go for T, right? And Spoiler alert, that's kind of actually how this topic is shaping up to be. Like everyone pretty much agrees that this topic is extremely broad and means very little, which is why topicality is, as you can probably tell, not playing a very major role at this camp. Yes. So ideally, everyone generally agrees about what the topic means. The AF follows the rules. There are no violations. The NAG is able to prep all the AFs. They have no beefs with the AF, right? So everyone agrees what the topic is. We have perfect alignment. Now... There are some things that just like with laws cause that to break down on lots of topics, right? So one thing that causes it to break down is when the AF is making a bad faith interpretation. They stand up and they're like, I know that this is not what the topic means, but I think I can write a really long 2AC block and I can get the judge to think that this is what the topic means. And I'm going to use that to skirt the negatives offense, right? This kind of thing tends to happen towards the end of the season usually, right? Where AFs are at their national tournaments and they're like trying to break fringe AFs. They're like trying to break out of what the net, the box the NEG is putting them in, right? There's also bad faith interpretations by the NEG where the NEG is using fake or crafty limits to try to limit down what the AF is allowed to do. This one usually happens toward the beginning of the season where like NEGs are testing to see what they can get away with forcing the AF to do. And then of course there is more fundamental challenges to 
whether topicality is viable at all, which is chaos, right? So if our goal is to reduce the number of T debates, right? So remember, our ideal world is everyone agrees what the topic means, right? So everyone agrees the rules are legitimate, the rules are clear, they have buy-in, they have consensus, people prepare for the same stuff. Our goal should be to come up with a version of this reasonability argument that facilitates that outcome. It facilitates an interpretation that everybody can basically get behind. And it discourages the NAG for go from going for bad faith interpretations while simultaneously not opening the door for the aft to just do whatever they want and not creating illegitimate topicality losses that cause people to reject the premise of topicality altogether. So that is kind of the core challenge that we are facing here. So what does the rule of lenity have to tell us about this? So in short, my pitch is that the way that you should talk about reasonability is that you should reformulate all of this stuff as a predictability DA to voting on arbitrary interpretation. You should reformulate it as a predictability DA to arbitrary interpretations. And when I say predictability DA, I don't mean predictability in the classic topicality sense of you have read a bad card or predictability in the classic sense of like the definition that you have read is not qualified, right? What I mean instead is that there needs to be something fundamental about the interpretation that makes it possible to predict in advance. And there is a couple of justifications for this. And to get some insight into what those are, I wanna go through some justifications that courts have for the rule of lenity and see if we can draw some analogies or some insights from those. So one justification has to do with due process. Due process. It violates due process to tell people that they have committed a crime when they didn't know that thing was a crime in advance. So someone reformulate that argument for me as an argument for why we should not vote on arbitrary or not fundamentally predictable interpretations in debate. Yeah. Or, and? You want to try it? So what's the dupe, what's the debate equivalent of due process? Think about when you've lost on T. What kinds of T losses have made you feel like your rights, your your fair notice has been violated? Okay, so water topic. Someone reads like the 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 t argument that's like you have to be regulations the one that's based on that like oregon stuff do you remember that one so would you feel like you're you were caught by surprise if you lost to this t argument or that you would have no reasonable idea that a judge would inter would like enforce this t argument against you what do you think no why Okay, so those are some good indicators, right? So notice, like, one of the things that you said was that the definitions were fine, the cards were actually good, which is what we normally think of as predictability. But more than that, it aligns with our typical understanding of what water protection is. It's consistent with the literature. Like, when we read the literature on water protection, we think about regulations all the time. Uh, it's a relatively consensus position, so a lot of people said it, right? There was not just good evidence, but a critical mass of evidence, right? So those are some, some reasonable indicators that would help you not get caught by surprise by this interpretation. Okay, what about T cessation of use? 
How many people lost a tea cessation of use? You must create a marine protected area, otherwise you're not topical. Yeah. So how'd you feel about that one differently? Why? Or like much, much less to be what I would think of when I think of like the resolution, just because like it's very arbitrary and like absurd that water protection would have to mean like the same thing. Okay, say more about that. Why would it be absurd? Um, because like how do you know? I guess like also like the literature because a lot of water protection isn't just you can use the things and also the definition of like like definition quality. Okay, so definition quality was lower. A lot of the literature was not really aligned with it because a lot of literature used the word protection, but we're not really using it in that context. So it didn't really reflect a consensus by a lot of people. I think an important one that underlies your like absurdity point is it is so clearly a skewed vision of the topic. Like no reasonable person could look at that version of the topic and conclude that like if the app was only marine protected areas, that would lead to a balanced version of the topic or no reasonable 2A going into their first tournament would survey the total set of definitions and conclude that that was the correct one that they had to follow, right? So it's predictability in this more meta sense of like, as a person going into the topic, trying to figure out what the topic means, would a reasonable person expect a reasonable judge to enforce this T interpretation against them, right? For one of these, the answer is yes, because it creates a reasonably balanced topic. It seems to, you know, reflect what the literature is talking about. And there's some reasonable looking cards behind it. Whereas for the other one, it's so clearly manifestly unfair and it's so fringe and there's so little evidence supporting it that there's much less predictability that a judge will enforce this interpretation against you. Okay. So another concept, so I'll write, I'll write down on the board. We'll circle back to this the idea of due process or fair notice. Okay, another justification for lenity is the idea of over deterrence being a problem. Over deterrence. So the idea with this one is that there are some things that we want legal behavior, there are other things that we don't want illegal behavior. When the boundary of the illegal behavior is defined fuzzily, or we don't know exactly what the illegal behavior is, and people expect that judges will enforce laws that are ambiguous about what in the fuzzy boundary is legal or illegal, there will be behavior that we want, which is legal, that does not happen because people incorrectly assume that it is illegal. Does that make sense? So, the laws are ambiguous. We don't know exactly what the boundary is. And this creates a chilling effect that prevents people from doing things that are legal and desirable. What's the debate equivalent of that? So let's unpack the metaphor first. Some things are legal and illegal. What's the equivalent? Right, some things are topical, some things are not topical. We want topical things. We don't want non-topical things. Why do we want topical things? So that we can debate. Well, right. But so, but here the, the issue is, so there's some fringe things, right? There's some fringe things that are excluded by some interpretations that are unreasonable. And there are some things that are included by interpretations, right? If the AF is worried that they're going to lose to T when they're on the fringe, they're less likely to read things that are on the fringe, right? So AFs that are topical will be under-examined because AFs will be worried about losing on unreasonable T interpretations when they read those AFs. What's the harm of that? Yeah. We no longer talk about topical areas and there's like less education on any given resolution. Less education on any given resolution? Sure. What kind of education tends to be lost when particularly AFs that are on the fringe get under-examined. What makes those Fs fringe Fs? It's, they're different than the core Fs in some way, right? Yeah, they don't talk about the same thing that like core Fs talk about. Right, so there's a conceptual core, which is unified by a similar set of concerns, but there's also a conceptual fringe, 
which are examples that are similar, but different in some way that throw a wrench into the normal discussion about how the topic works, right? That's why they're fringe Fs. That's why there's a risk that those Fs are gonna lose to T. Why should we want to debate about those Fs? Those Fs that are topical, but that throw the wrench into the works of the topic in some way. So something, something that you don't get by debating about the core F, I'm gonna be even more precise about that and say, it's, it's something that you, you learn something about a way in which that an argument on the topic applies differently to different areas, right? So if you only debate about one set of things and they share a common set of characteristics, then you learn about the way that arguments apply to the topic kind of in one way, in a way that's flat, in a way that's very simple, right? You know, it's the CAFOs app versus the BizCon disad. It's the big agriculture app versus the BizCon disad, right? It's a bunch of stuff that is really, really big versus the BizCon disad, right? So if you debated the topic in this way, you might come away with the conclusion that water regulations and business interests are generally at odds with each other, right? What you would not learn about is things that are on the fringe of the topic, right? Maybe because they regulate a less large economic activity, maybe because they use a slightly different regulatory mechanism that is not command and control, but is something else that's reasonably close to regulations, but is not regulatory in, a, in the same exact way as the CAFOs app is, right? Those apps might be good for business confidence, but you would sacrifice your learning about the ways in which business confidence and economic or in water protection regulation interact if you are deterred by the prospect of losing to unreasonable topicality arguments from reading affirmatives that are on the fringe. Does that Broad idea makes sense. Okay, so two is over deterrence. Okay, a third idea, and this is probably the least compelling part of this analogy, but a justification for lenity is democracy. Congress should make up what the crimes are, not courts. Because Congress is elected and courts are not elected. What's the analogy here? Eh, well, not really, because in our analogy, the neg is like the the neg is like the the prosecutor. They're like saying that the app is the one that's violated the law. Judge, please put them in, in topicality jail. Yeah. Is that democracy would be like the app or like the debaters themselves? And then the judge would be like the court system enforcing the legislation? Yeah, not really. Who writes the topic? Who writes the laws in our analogy? Yeah, the topic committee. So the topic committee is very stupid in high school, so this is why this is the least compelling part of the analogy. But theoretically, another component of the analogy would be the topic committee writes the topic. The topic committee should be the one that decides what is topical and what is not topical. Judges applying arbitrary, ambiguous interpretations that people wouldn't have reasonably expected when writing the topic should not be the ones to decide that. I'm not going to write that down even because nobody should even care about that. Um, but that the term for this is framers intent. The people who wrote the topic should be the ones that decide what it means. Um, okay, so let's crystallize some of the examples of how we decide whether stuff links to our predictability DA, right? So Nora gave a couple of examples earlier. So how do we know when things are a reasonable interpretation or an unreasonable interpretation that links to our predictability DA to arbitrary interpretations, right? The card is bad. It flies in the face of the literature. It flies in the face of topic consensus. So debaters have been going to tournaments over the course of the season. They've settled on a list of what things are topical and what are not topical. You know, after a certain point where like everybody is going for the KFOS app and everybody is winning all their debates and nobody cares about topicality, right? You should start to settle on an expectation that 
the app should have to be able to prep the KFOS app and then I should have to respond with a case tag that is specific, right? Yeah. Um, for like technical things, why is that like separate from like because like how is the topic decided outside of like reading what has been written in that response? Yeah, so this is like uh, the, the literature is like what the cards say, like what authors in the field say, whereas by topic consensus, what I mean is like what have debaters been doing or like what has the community landed on as the practice, right? So the analogy here would be for flies in the face of literature, if we're interpreting an ambiguous criminal law and a similar term has been used in lots of other laws and has universally been, been interpreted in one way, it would be unpredictable to interpret it a different way. Topic consensus would be, there have been a bunch of court cases about this particular law that have been decided in this way and it would be unpredictable to depart from that. Um, the force of this is probably, again, the weakest out of these three considerations because some judges just categorically don't care about it. Like if you ask Michaela, she's gonna aggressively make fun of me about saying this. Um, but I think it's worth throwing out there potentially just because I think it's just an extra form of evidence that helps us figure out what is and is not an unpredictable interpretation if the entire community has crystallized around a thing. And additionally, you know, if you recall our fundamental goal of topicality, I think if the community has crystallized around an interpretation, then whether that interpretation is the best one available or not, that topicality interpretation is serving the crystallizing role for the disagreement that we want to be getting out of topicality. Like it is doing what topicality is supposed to do, which is getting everybody to agree on what the topic means. And then the last one that I'll write down is manifest unfairness. Like this is the cessation of use example where like, obviously if the interpretation is totally egregious, right? Anybody looking at this interpretation can see that it is completely unfair and ridiculous, right? Even though the tech or the line by line might've gone weird, everybody can see like, this is terrible for the F. There might be some like other consideration that outweighs on the line by line, but it's unpredictable to enforce interpretations that are obviously terrible for one side because the topic is supposed to equalize what debates are about. So what's the value of phrasing this argument in this way? Notice at no point did I phrase any of this as competing interpretations are bad, right? Didn't do that. Instead, we've taken what is normally an argument that we use to compare interpretations within the competing interpretations paradigm, and we have added some stuff to it that generates offense independent of the comparison between the interpretations, right? So this stuff and this thing. Why is this better? Because judges who do not want to vote on reasonability and who have told you to bug off because you have said don't evaluate competing interpretations and I don't know what that means, or you have said something on this list and I don't know which one you mean, so get out of here. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to compare the interpretations and I'm going to vote neg on limits. Those judges know how to weigh a predictability DA. Do you see what I mean? Like, if they want to do competing interpretations, they know how to evaluate a debate in which one side is presenting a predictability DA and comparing that against the limits argument, right? So make your reasonability thing as a predictability DA, right? It is unpredictable to punish AF teams for violating unreasonable interpretations. Now, we're making a trade-off with this phrasing, which is that this demand is less ambitious than the one that is being made by that stuff. This stuff says, if the AF interpretation is reasonable, we ought to win. 
This stuff says, if the neg interpretation is unreasonable, we don't lose. So the burden is higher. You do need to present some evidence or some demonstration for why the neg interpretation is unreasonable, not just that your own interpretation is reasonable. But the benefit of doing it this way is that a bunch of judges who were never going to vote on reasonability before are now going to consider voting for you on reasonability. Does this make sense? Okay. So I wanna walk through how this explanation helps us deal with common re-raises by the neg. So when you are going for T or when someone is going for T against you, you know, you got your reasonability, the last argument on the page, what are some arguments that the neg will make against reasonability? Yeah. So yeah, Connor, sir. This is an unreasonable like topic. Okay. So AT neg. Some of reasonable equals unreasonable. How does this explanation help us deal with that? If there's proper consensus, or if there's like a certain amount of like literature on something, then uh, there isn't like this like insurmountable like amount of reasonable affirmatives. There's just like this many reasonable affirmatives, and you're not just like adding on increasingly. Sure. Yeah. So I think broadly the idea that you're getting at is like this is not just always automatically true. It's something to be demonstrated, right? The sum of reasonable interpretations is not some abstract thing. It is like a concrete set of things that meets a certain set of criteria. And more broadly, we're not even saying that apps should automatically get to win for presenting a reasonable interpretation. What we're saying is that apps shouldn't lose when the neg accuses them of violating an unreasonable interpretation, right? So one, turn the sum of unreasonable interpretations is extra unreasonable for the app. Make sense? Fuck this, my handwriting sucks. I'm not actually gonna write this down. Um, this isn't helping anyone. Um, so one, the sum of unreasonable interpretations is extra unreasonable for the app. Two, The sum of reasonable interpretations is not automatically larger. It's a contestable claim. So one factor is if all the reasonable interpretations are the same in all relevant matters, like they all access the same body of literature and they are all interpretations that are expected by members of the community, then there's no impact to that topic, because it's a topic that is already shaping negative preparation and shaping affirmative selection, which means this topic, this sum of reasonable interpretations topic is doing what topicality is meant to do, coordinating app and neg research. Okay. What else? What else do people say when we're neg and we're answering reasonability? Yeah. Judge intervention. Judge intervention. How does this stuff help us answer that? It's not like an arbitrary determination of whether an interest is reasonable, but that it's like predictable and like limits for the sake of limits is probably more judge intervention because they're just like determining what is like the best for the topic. Yeah, so limits overall else is a worse form of judge intervention is a fine argument, but yeah, like bottom line, 
when we're phrasing this as a predictability GA, we're not doing any of this. It's not like a Rorschach test where the judge just decides in a vacuum based on their own intuition, whether they like the app or they don't like the app or whether they think it's close or not close without any reference or debate by either side, right? The judge is evaluating offense against an interpretation. If the judge is incapable of doing that, then the judge could not judge a T debate, right? Every single component of the T debate, every single component of the standards is exactly the same as what this interpretation or as this source of offense is getting for the app, right? Which means it cannot be the case the judge intervention is a reason not to evaluate a predictability DA to administering arbitrary punishment in the context of topicality. Okay, what else? Um, like reasonability to manage the top sentence as fired. Okay, so I think a, a way that I'll reformulate that, which I correct me if I'm wrong, expresses the same idea, but like our offense proves that your interpretation is unreasonable. Similar idea. Okay. Again, another one that might be true. In a vacuum, it is conceivably possible for the offense to be so great that it demonstrates the app is unreasonable. With these ones, as I was asking, as I was pointing out with the hypotheticals, like what if it's 15%? What if it's 50%? You don't know how much of our offense is required to prove that the app is unreasonable. What about with this? What is the condition? that the judge has to determine is true for the judge to decide that our offense means the app is unreasonable or to reach the equivalent conclusion. Yeah. The app is not within the like topic literature or if there is like no topic consensus or like it doesn't meet all the like numbers on the left. Right, so either this, either the judge could decide this just doesn't apply, right? This, this doesn't link to the interpretation because it's a reasonable one. It meets these standards or it links to the app's interpretation because it's unreasonable. It violates these standards. But what else? Suppose the next interpretation is actually pretty unreasonable, but it's also way better for debatability based on the line by line of the standards debate. What do we do then? Exactly, just weigh it, right? How do you know if our offense means the app is unreasonable? You compare the offense to the predictability DA to administering arbitrary punishment, just like you do with any predictability DA, and then you decide. So like, maybe it's unreasonable, maybe it's not unreasonable, who knows, let's do the impact off and find out. Okay, what else? Has anyone heard the phrase race to the top? Competing interpretations isn't a race to the bottom, it's a race to the top, says the nag. So to unpack that one, what does race to the bottom mean? Like when the app says competing interpretation causes a race to the bottom, what are they saying? Um, the nag is incentivized to find the most limiting interpretation. Yeah, exactly. So race to the bottom, the idea is if we're just compete, if we're just comparing interpretations, the neg will keep moving the goalposts. I'm sure that's another phrase that you've heard in two AC blocks that detached from any explanation. The neg will just keep moving the goalposts to generate cheap wins without substance, and they will keep making the topic smaller and smaller. And that's bad for reasons that the app never specifies. So race to the top is like turn, narrow topics good actually. So we should, it's like, yeah, your thing is a slippery slope fallacy and it's like stupid, but yeah, let's get on a slippery slope. Let's ride it all the way. The smallest topic is the best topic. So what does this have to say about that? I kind of just said the answer. The slippery slope piece. So like, what, what, what is our answer? If the 
it means that if you're comparing small topic as opposed to the hospital for the app, the possible because like even the most narrow app will have some like interpretation that that interprets the device in a way that it so but what tools does our does our thing give us to screen out that stuff it's like yeah the smallest possible interpretations could conceivably have a card but those are really really unpredictable to administer right so it's a sliding scale right sure there is some point at which limits are valuable and we should try to preserve them but at the other extreme when we get so limited that it's obviously unfair or the evidence quality that is being used to impose those limits is really, really poor and out of line with the topic consensus, the predictability DA to administering those interpretations as punishment for the AF, reading those AFs is really big, right? So the answer to this is reject the premise of the slippery slope. It's not a race to the bottom or a race to the top, right? There is a point at which the predictability DA to the marginal improvements and limits outweighs it. And that is the point where we should be. So no, it does not slide to infinite limits. And it also doesn't slide to infinite size in the other direction. It's a balance because we have two competing sources of offense and we can weigh them. I will add in some additional notions, which you can maybe put into your topicality block when you're neg, but which I have never really heard, but only have heard in the analogy from the rule of lenity. Wait, is that a hand? Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so last two ideas that kind of spill over from rule of lenity land into here. Five, over deterrence, good. Over deterrence, good. Two A's should be quaking in their boots when they read a marginal F. It'll scare them toward the center. And that center is a good place for the F to be because it enables clash, it enables the neg to have a, a, a chance, right? So what's our answer to that? And the, the lenity analogy, by the way, is like, if we have a vague child pornography law, it is probably a good thing that people are scared off from doing marginal child pornography, right? That is not socially desirable activity that we want to keep around just because it's technically within the gray zone of what the law prohibits or doesn't prohibit. Is that a hand? I think so. Okay. Um, do you like... This is a topic to topic like limits like the edge of the topic is so big and so large that like literally anything on outside of this like on the like ridge of the topic should be like over the turn people should be forced back to the center because otherwise all that i think that goes back to like the sound like reasonable that's the neg argument that's the next argument oh how do we answer that yeah uh, yeah, Nora. Uh, maybe like the fringe apps are good. Yep, the fringe apps are good. And the kind of over deterrence that is created by voting for the kind of interpretation that the neg is forwarded here is bad. In the lenity analogy, there's basically two kinds of ambiguity. One where there's like illegal, that's this stuff. Then there's like immoral or undesirable, and that's this stuff. And then there is legal and moral. Here, ambiguity deters this activity, and that's good, right? We don't know if it's legal or illegal. We do know it's immoral. It's good to deter it, right? That's not what topicality is. Topicality, the illegal and the legal, coincide with the quote unquote immoral or undesirable and the moral or desirable, right? So any over deterrence is of socially beneficial activity, which is reading topical apps, right? Which means we should demonstrate that we live in this world and not this world. Marginal apps are good. Make sense? Okay. Yeah. 
Um, so how do you explain that, like, that the education that you get from, like, fringe acts outweighs the, like, and it's arguments for why it's over the fringe? Yeah, so basically what I've laid out here is a framework for talking about reasonability. The heavy lift and the extra burden that is kind of landing on you here is to do the actual comparisons. The reason this is harder than reasonability debating is that reasonability debating just says like, fuck the premise of T. Basically, if our interpretation is like, fine, then we just automatically win. Doesn't require you to do any comparisons once you've won your model of debate is fine. And you've like won some observations about your thing, about your interpretation, you basically win the debate. Here, you have to do that specific impact comparison. So like one way to do it would be to make an argument that the only point of limits is to foster education. And education is damaged when the AF is forced into only reading mainstream AFs because it erases the way that atypical examples of the resolution throw meaningful wrinkles into NEG preparation. Those atypical examples also create a higher burden for NEGs to familiarize themselves with their arguments more deeply so that not only do they apply them to pre-prepared stock examples that they're familiar with, but they're ready to apply the concepts they've prepared to new examples on the fly. And that's the best way to foster learning because the true test of understanding is whether you can apply an idea that you've learned, not whether you can memorize a link block that you wrote about KFOs. Those things outweigh limits for education outweighs limits reasons or whatever, right? That's just one example, but with all of these arguments, that's kind of the last piece that you need to talk about. Okay. Uh, last response that I was gonna talk about is that fair notice is a fiction. A lot of people who write about fair notice in the context of lenity say basically criminals don't read laws. So who the fuck cares about this? It's like not a real thing. It's not a real due process problem. Fair notice, fake, hopefully, the reason this does not apply to debate is obvious. Who here has not read the resolution? No one, okay. Make sense? All right, questions before I ship you off to your next place. Yeah, what's up? Um, so like, if there's also the predictability debate on like, the more evidence you question, and then there's also this part about reasonability, which is like that also predictability percent. Like, how do those two interact? And then in the QAR, like, where do you do? So I think the impact to them is very similar, which is that if the app couldn't have anticipated it, it doesn't shape preparation, it doesn't inform the way that the neg prepares, and it's unfair to administer it, right? It's just that the link arguments that you're making to this predictability argument are broader. In fact, when you're going for this, to avoid the judge being like, okay, there was no reasonability argument, so I defaulted to competing interpretations and voted neg, you should probably do the judge instruction explicitly of, hey, if you're uncomfortable with reasonability, you can evaluate these same ideas as reasons that it is unpredictable to administer an unreasonable interpretation, i.e., more links to our existing predictability offense, which we have demonstrated outweighs. So I think, yeah, agreed that the impact to those things is very similar. This just gives you more links, right? Because the idea of reasonability is like to make it so like the only source of offense when the interpretations are really close and the negs is slightly more limiting is not just limits, right? Because if you just think about it in the context of competing interpretations, apps will often go for like, well, the margin of AF innovation that is hurt by this is greater than the margin of limits that is hurt by this and AF innovation outweighs limits, right? That's not really conceptually what we wanna be talking about, right? And judges who have a problem with reasonability will not vote on reasonability in that context because they don't know what it means, right? So this is a different vocabulary for doing that. It's like, yeah, the interpretations are close. They both have reasonable cards behind them and your thing is a little bit more limiting, but, we have other sources of predictability offense that are not just based on the quality of the card that demonstrate why it's unpredictable to administer the violation that you have tried to say that we should lose for. Does that make sense? So, like, it's a, that, like, number one, like, the card is bad, like, that's more of the stuff that happens, like, higher. Yeah, like, exactly. And then the other three are, like, you can, like, Yep. Yep.
Um, and like an example of what I'm talking about here, by the way, is like, you know, on the water topic, there were like all those interpretations that were like water protection is four things. And there were like a billion cards like that. And they all listed different four things. And some of them listed five things. So it's like if the app stands up and reads a five things interpretation, the neg stands up and reads a four things interpretation, and both cards are reasonable and from qualified people, and the neg is like four is less than five, so about neg, like that's what this is for. Yeah. Do you think that like to win reasonability, you have to win that the app interprets is predictable, or is it just that the neg interprets non? Um, I would say that it is better if you win that the F interpretation is reasonable by these metrics and the neg interpretation is not reasonable by these metrics, but it is not required that the F win that their interpretation is reasonable. I would, yeah, it is way better if you can win that your interpretation is reasonable. Yeah. Last question, so like in the Chile team, do you think we should not like not frame it as like competing interests as causing to the bottom part? I would say, depending on, it, it kind of depends on your judge. So sometimes you'll, you're going to know that a judge likes reasonability and that's fine. And you can keep the conventional framing. Sometimes you'll know that a judge hates reasonability and that you'll say, like, maybe you'll not even bother putting it in. You'll just phrase it this way. I would say the default phrasing should be make your reasonability argument and then say, even if competing interpretations are good, err heavily against administering unreasonable against voting for unreasonable interpretations because doing so is unpredictable. And that's all you would say in the 2AC and then later on you would develop this argument more completely. Yeah. Make sense? Cool. I don't want to make you late to your next elective, so you all should go.